writers and readers, I'm Christy Stratus and today I'm going to be doing the unpopular opinions tag. I'm really excited about this one. I was tagged by Mike Pilgrim so thank you so much Mike. Definitely check out his video, I will link it down below. And he specifically asked for me to be snarky because he likes my snarky videos. You know, your wish is my command, I'm just doing what he asked me to do. These are really just for, for fun, they're my opinions and I am being harsh, like extra harsh just for fun, so don't take offense at anything. Really just remember this is all for, a, you know, a good time, a laugh. Because I like to dress appropriately, I have this shirt on, this character is in combat, because I'm about to be. So the first question is, a popular book or series that you didn't like? Okay, I disliked two books so much that I had to actually not choose between them. The first one is Double Cross by James Patterson and the second one is 1Q84 by Haruki Murakami. Double Cross I think has like a solid four stars on Goodreads. That really shocked me actually. That was the first James Patterson book I ever read and that was a big mistake. I should not have started with that one. There was no way for me to know that. But I hear that his earlier work is way better, that this is sort of a fluke, that I really should try some earlier work, and I am completely open to that, but let me just tell you about this disaster. First of all, all the characters are completely flat. Now, some people like to make the excuse that this is based on a series of Alex Cross novels. And so if you haven't read them before, you wouldn't understand the characters and that's why they're flat. That is not why they're flat. They're flat because it's not written very well. Are the Harry Potter characters flat in any of the books? Just because you know them, they're not. So this was just a situation where they came out very, very flat, all of them. There are just a lot of situations that are ridiculous, they're unrealistic, they don't really add up all the time. I have to tell you that one of the things that drove me the most nuts was the ending. Yes, this is kind of a spoiler, but you shouldn't read this book anyway, so it's not gonna spoil it any more than it already has been spoiled. What I believe happened here is we have a situation where the end is very strange. You have a character that is killed, and I won't specify who, but a character that is killed and then jumps up miraculously and literally runs away, just off into the sunset. It's absolutely ludicrous. I was angry when I read it because it made no sense. It was almost comical. Here's what I think happened. I think the publisher has said to James Patterson, you killed off this person and you know, they're a pretty good person that we would like to continue with in future novels. Oh, I'm sorry, did you say something, publishers? Uh, you said you wanted me to keep that character? Is, is that what you said? I'm, I'm busy writing my next five novels. Uh, apologies there, what'd you say? We think that you shouldn't kill that person because we could use them in the future. They'd be good for sales. Oh, uh, well, you know what? I already killed them, so uh, I, you know what? I'm just gonna bring him back. Uh, he's just gonna, he's just gonna hop up and go off into the sunset. That is what I think happened because it really seems like it had a solid ending and then it was just completely destroyed by that ridiculousness. That's just a brief summary of what I had a problem with in that book. 1Q84, I know a lot of people think this is brilliant. I have read other work by Haruki Murakami. I read The Strange Library and I did appreciate that. I thought it was very well done. It was different. It was something that you could read multiple times and really get a lot out of. So I do appreciate his work with this one. It needed to be a third of the length it was. It just had so much bulk, a lot of repetition. I really felt that it treated the audience like we were stupid, like, oh, do you don't remember that from the first quarter of the book, do you? Well, you know, I was paying attention when I read it. No, you don't remember it. Let me just repeat it word for word here. Does that work for you? No, I kind of hate that it's condescending. I'm just gonna do it. I don't care. I don't care at all. It just really annoyed me and I don't like being spoken down to in a book. So if you have a book that speaks down to readers, don't recommend it to me because I will hate it. And I did feel like the ending was just he wrote himself into a corner. It really would have taken something huge and epic at the end to resolve. And it just, I don't know what to do with this. So, uh, you know, instead of resolving all this and explaining all these things that need explaining, there was so, so, so much that we were like waiting. We were just waiting and I, it's a 48 or 46 hour audiobook that I listened to. This is like a, full two days, okay, with no sleep. I hung in there and after all that, 
we get this cheap ending where it's just like, um, I'll just push them out of this world and uh, then we don't have to answer any questions. And I was really left at the end completely dissatisfied, very irritated, did not work for me. Number two, I'm sure that felt like three answers to you. <laughs> Number two, a popular book or series that everyone else seems to hate but you love. I couldn't really think of a really one that people hate. So I did see that Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn is rated number 11 in the 25 most hated books by Book Riot readers, and that surprised me a lot. I know that there are people that do not like Gone Girl, and I think I understand the reason why I'm talking to you, Jason Greensize. <laughs> if you're looking at it as something that is sort of like a mystery, which I think it probably was advertised as, I did guess, you know, what was gonna happen a certain amount of the way through, but I didn't find that to be a problem because my fascination was with how is this woman pulling this stuff off? How are these people reacting? How does it all come together? What was the point? There was a lot more in that direction that fascinated me. And so I still appreciated it. Yeah, it was not like surprising, you know, you could guess the big thing. I still liked it and I appreciated it. Number three, a love triangle where the main character ended up with the person you did not want them to end up with. A lot of people already know the whole story of Atlas Shrugged, even if you haven't read it. You know, just in case you're planning on reading it and you don't want any spoilers, then this does have spoilers. But here's the thing. If you're a Dagny Tagger and you meet Hank Reardon and you get together and while you're together, this man improves himself over time and just becomes more and more this wonderful person in your eyes, this like perfect guy. He's just so absolutely wonderful. And this isn't like me trying to say, yes, he's a great character or I love him or anything like that. I'm trying to say that he ends up improving himself in Dagny's eyes and he goes through so much to grow himself. They share so much in common. They share a lot of things in common that not many people do. They seem to have a wonderful relationship. And then John Galt comes along, who she doesn't really know, and she's just like, that's it, I'm gonna dump you. I don't even care. I can't, I can't. I actually had to stop reading the book for a long time because I was just like, flip the table. I just couldn't get over that. And it really upset me to the degree that, like I said, I couldn't even read it for a while. Imagine if you're with your perfect person and you give them up because someone comes along who may or may not be okay. Number four, a popular book genre that you hardly reach for. On this one, I have to agree with Mike Pilgrim. Uh, YA is definitely it for me. I rarely read YA. I do here and there if it's something unique, but for the most part, I find that if I read the back cover blurb, I can tell from it, from the phrasing, from just the standard blurb, what's gonna happen, who's on whose side, who's gonna fall in love, who's gonna live, who's gonna die. It's not that hard, it's very predictable, and I have a problem with that. So I don't read that many YA books. I'm very familiar with them, I edit them, and I understand why and where these things come from and the purpose. But for me, if I'm gonna spend time pleasure reading, it's not gonna be that genre. The one exception that I'll say is We Were Liars that I really love. I think it's fantastic. That was one when it first came out, the ratings were like very up and down, especially on Goodreads. A lot of people were saying that they didn't really care for it. I personally think that it shouldn't have even been advertised as YA because I don't think you can truly appreciate it until you're out of college and you've had some time in the real world and then you can really get it. But I mean, it won tons of YA awards, so I guess I can't really say that for sure, but that was what I was finding a lot of the people who this book was directed at at that time that it came out, weren't really grasping a lot of the things about it. And it was because I think you have to grow up first. So I like that kind of YA, which is pretty much very rare. Number five, a popular or beloved character that you do not like. Okay, I really couldn't think of one of these. I really scoured the web for beloved characters that I could hate, but honestly, I just couldn't find one. I think that if I did have one and I read something long or really long time ago and I just don't remember, I probably just forgot it because I didn't like them. And so I just put it out of my mind. I decided to to sort of flip that around a little bit and I wanted to tell you that I actually like Brutus from Julius Caesar. <laughs> Don't hate me. <laughs> I actually like him because he is just, he's a good-hearted guy. Wait, just hear me out. He's actually not that bad of a guy. He's just so easily manipulated. He thinks he's doing the right thing and he really believes that, oh yeah, sure, this is for the best, you know, this is what we need to do. But he's just, doesn't have that much up here. And it's a problem because he's just so easily manipulated. And he's like, yeah, this is a good idea. And then at the end, he's like, mm, I better kill myself. Number six, 
a popular author that you can't seem to get into. For me, that was Ransom Riggs. I don't know if he's still a thing, but he was a big thing at one point with the, oh, I can't even remember the name of it, Peculiar Children with all the cool photographs and stuff. I was really interested in that book. It came across one way in the blurb and I had an expectation that was not met at all. So the tone was extremely different than what I expected. I got bored pretty quickly. Part of that was because of my expectation, but I just couldn't get into it after that. It wasn't what I had wanted to read. It wasn't what the blurb said to me. And so I just couldn't get into it. I was like, eh, eh, anybody could do this kind of thing. I didn't care for it. I didn't find it unique anymore. Maybe if I had read the whole thing, I would have found something unique in it, but I really lost interest and couldn't do it. I got like 80 pages into it, 50 or 80 pages into it, and then it was just, I just called it quits. Number seven, a popular book trope that you're tired of seeing. I have to agree with Mike Pilgrim on this one. The chosen one syndrome is really annoying. We just always happen to join these heroes right when they are being discovered. It annoys me. I know a lot of books are like that. I know it's probably meant to encourage people, anybody, you know, whether it's children or young adults or adults. You never know when your time is going to come that you have like a very special moment or you become what you always wanted to be, a dream will come true, stuff like that. But I have to say that the way it's done is always the same. That really bothers me a lot, especially because when I was a kid and I was reading, I didn't read much young adult because I actually, as a young adult, found it completely unrelatable. So I was like the only kid that was reading classics instead of that because I could get that better. But I remember thinking like, how come none of this makes sense? How come none of it is true? How come none of it is realistic? None of this ever happens. Like, and it, especially when it takes place in like YA types of settings. And it's always like, oh, you know that loser kid in your class? Like, he's gonna save the world. And it was just like really annoying because even if you're just not miss popular or whatever you're sort of like it's not gonna happen okay we're just gonna be the way we are like and that's okay it would just really annoy me even back then but the other thing i wanted to tell you that really annoys me is this whole extremely mature child trope and i hate this in movies too when you have to use a child to just convey these messages of maturity to adults and like it rarely, in my opinion, is something unique that works. Here and there, they'll pull it off where the kid just happens to say something bright or where the kid is pretty mature for their age because they've been in a difficult situation before. And so they have some level of still kid-like maturity. But when you've got a kid, and I'm not, this does not apply to Matilda. That's a different story. But when you've got a kid running around who's so much smarter than the adult and just has like all this ridiculous information and like knowledge of love and do this and do that and they're always right, it drives me nuts because it's absolutely ridiculous. Sure, every once in a while there's gonna be a really mature kid, but using it as a device to move the plot along annoys me. If you wanna have a character like that that has something to do with it, sure, but don't use it as the device you have to throw in to make the story move when it's not moving. Number eight, a popular series that you have no interest in reading. Okay, well, I don't have an interest in reading a lot of popular series because a lot of times they're predictable. We all know what's gonna happen, especially if it's popular. People wanna see the same thing, and I totally get that, so I'm not really putting that down. It's just not for me. So I've never read or seen Divergent, Hunger Games, any of that stuff. I already knew. I saw the commercial and I said, this is what's gonna happen, and it did. But, so let's get into something else. The Shannara, series by Terry Brooks. I hope I said that accurately. I know in fantasy it can be difficult to pronounce the right thing. So my problem with this was that I did pick up one of those books. I was listening to it on audiobook and I found the beginning very hard to get into. I really hung in there even through this beginning that was I was bored already. But then we got to the point and remember this is an audiobook so I'm listening to it in the car and we get to the point where we have a fantasy creature. And fantasy creatures are very difficult because naming them, to me it has to sound like something that might be able to exist. It can't be random syllables thrown together unless you're talking about a language that actually has that, then that's fine. But if you're just gonna throw things together and it sounds really fake, I cannot read that. So when they get to the creature called a Gromf, I literally hit the thing and was like, off, that's it, I'm done. I just couldn't deal with a, a Gromf. Why? Can't you think of a better name than a Gromf? Just feeding my pet Gromf over here. That sounds very realistic. Watch out, there's a Gromf behind you. I'm just, I can't, I, I'm not buying it. The only fantasy book I ever quit faster was the one with the billion spider army, where once I read that, just shut the book. That was it, I can't, that's disgusting. It's, it's too far, it's too far. 
Number nine, the saying goes, the book is always better than the movie, but what movie or TV show adaptation do you prefer more than the book? The Maltese Falcon, actually. The movie, in my opinion, is way better. Well, I shouldn't say way better, it's better. The book is very good, it's enjoyable. I found that the character of Sam Spade actually translated better to me in film than it even did on paper. On paper, I found him a little bit strange. His reactions don't quite match together, and I get what they're going for, but to me, it, they didn't quite pull it off. It was just a little bit too erratic and all over the place. But in the movie, it all really pulls together and makes a lot of sense, and you can get Sam Spade, and you can really enjoy his character. Believe it or not, in the book, they actually describe Humphrey Bogart's character as a blonde Satan which I thought was really, really funny because it's kind of the opposite of what Humphrey Bogart looks like. It just really cracked me up because it doesn't fit Humphrey Bogart's face. Of course, he was the perfect actor for it, but it always cracks me up a little bit when the description in the book doesn't match the movie. It's the way it, you, it, it many times comes out, but I just like comparing the two. Anyway, uh, the Maltese Falcon book actually has a number of scenes that didn't make it to the movie. They are extremely close together. There are many scenes that are exact. Even in terms of dialogue, they're just copy-paste pretty much, which is great. But there are some areas where they, they cut stuff out because it was either unnecessary or it just dragged on a bit and sort of went in a loop. And it's not a long book either. It's like 100 pages or something. I don't remember exactly. But it's not a long book and they were able to cut stuff out and make it this fantastic movie. And I really believe that it tra just translated so much better not only with those cutout parts, but with Sam Spade, the way they made him in the movie was just much more of a solid character that you could really understand and enjoy. The rest of the movie was fantastic too, and I have to say that some of the spins they put, I mean, they didn't stray far, but they really picked all the right people for the cast that just improved the experience of the story so, so much. So I would definitely recommend comparing the two. If you've ever read and seen that, then let me know in the comments what you think. That wraps it up for the unpopular opinions tag. Just as a bonus to give you guys something else to dislike me for, here we go. This is the only time I will get to say this. I never finished the Harry Potter series and it wasn't because I didn't like it. I actually absolutely loved it. I reached book five and I'm a very slow reader and it's a very long book and at the time I was not that into YA. Although this is for all ages and I totally know that, I was sort of like okay I could either read two or three classic literature books or I can read one Harry Potter book. And at the time, Harry Potter was just enjoyment for me and I wasn't really getting anything else out of it. I think now if I read it, it might be different and I could get a lot more out because, I mean, the writing style is brilliant all in itself and the world building. I decided that I would rather read the classic literature. And like I said earlier in this video, that's the kind of teen I was for some reason. I really just liked classic literature and could relate to it a lot better than I could YA. I never finished the Harry Potter series. Leave your hate below. Don't leave hate. I'm a, I'm a decent person, I promise. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for spending time with me and I will see you soon.